you know, my, my big, I, my goal and my kind of like my lifestyle that I live by is like, you know, elk hunting's great. Hunting's great. Right. Like that's my passion. But at the end of the day, like I have a job to do and it's not elk hunt. Like elk hunting doesn't pay my bills. It actually puts me back for my bills. But Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, like I work for a city department that people rely on me, people rely on my crew and they call us for the the worst day of their life. So if I'm not physically fit to do my job, you know, how, why am I here? So I take that. I'm pretty prideful in that. And obviously it correlates to hunting, but you know, I don't, I don't train just for elk hunting. I don't train for just the mountains. I train Like I said, it's a routine now. What's going on, guys? Hope you're having a fantastic Saturday, weekend, whatever day of the week it is that you're listening to this. But today, as this episode's coming out, it's Saturday. Hope you're able to get outside, make some memories, spend time with loved ones. Today's guest, we have Jeremy. Jeremy is a good friend. I've met him through Elk Shape Camp. He's friends with Dan as well. He's gone through, and he just absolutely loves whitetail hunting he loves fitness he is just all around a great individual loves his family and loves getting out west when he can to go hunt elk but his bread and butter is whitetail so we're going to dive into a little bit of how he balances his career his family hunting and also of course coming out west uh, to do hunts out west as well so you guys enjoy this conversation jeremy is just a wealth of knowledge and experience knows what he's doing. He's a killer. Absolutely loves getting out there with a bow, getting after it and shooting target archery as well. He just loves archery. So with that being said, guys, hope you're having a great one. Want to remind you, if you're still listening to this in February, if it's in February, we have a giveaway that we're doing with Mountain Archery Fest, four tickets and four bow hitches, one for each ticket holder. You'll be able to go and shoot either with me here in, in Utah, or to a local shoot with your friends. We're giving a ticket for you and a buddy to go. So guys, get in on that giveaway. Check out the link down below. If it's after February, sorry guys if you missed out on that, but we're going to have more giveaways coming. I'm going to do one each month at least so that we can give back to you guys. I appreciate the growth. Thank you so much. Have a fantastic rest of your day. And of course, get out, live your life, and love it. All right, everyone, welcome back to the Red Beard Outdoors podcast. I've got an outstanding guest for you guys today. His name is Jeremy Lopez. He is the fire captain of, I don't even know where you're, somewhere in Wisconsin, northern Wisconsin, somewhere <laughs> cold. <laughs> but he just recently got promoted uh, to fire captain, so big congratulations to that. This has been a huge year for Jeremy. Uh, I met Jeremy actually through social media, and then we ended up bunking together at Elk Shape Camp up there in Wisconsin. Uh, he talked to me a little bit about whitetail hunting. And then we were talking before this podcast about some of the ways that he hunts whitetail. He's had an amazing year overall. Uh, just so many accomplishments for you, man. So I'm stoked to share that with the people. Uh, but who are you in a nutshell for, for the audience and people that don't know who you are? Yeah. Well, like you said, I appreciate the intro, but uh, I'm Jeremy. I, I live in Northern Wisconsin. Uh, I work full time as a firefighter and I'm married, have a child on the way, and I love to bow hunt. Um, That's pretty much me in a nutshell. I love archery as a whole. Um, It's my passion for sure. So, and, you know, I do a little side uh, fishing and whatnot. So that's pretty much me in a nutshell, man. Just love to fish, love to hunt, and, you know, spend time with the family as much as I can and, and work hard and play hard. So exactly yeah jeremy's just one of those guys that he's he's found a way to make time for his loved ones and his his passion and everything that he does with whitetail hunting and uh obviously he he loves shooting a bow he does some target dabbles in target archery uh, we talked a little bit about that which i'm going to need to talk to you a little bit more about that as i'm getting into that i'm actually we talked about it back during elk shape camp that i was thinking of getting into it i have ex- actually purchased a target bow so now <laughs> now we're, we're getting there um but uh with that being said let's let's start off with kind of your journey in the outdoors uh how you got into hunting in general because again guys jeremy 
not just being a firefighter and being ready for all the calendar shoots that he has to do throughout the year. And that's all they do as firefighters. Uh, <laughs> but he, he enjoys training. He enjoys fitness and he is, he's an in shape individual. And, and I would love to touch on that portion of uh, your life along with why that's important to you as a whitetail hunter, not just a Western hunter. So mm -hmm. first and foremost, how'd you get started in the outdoors, Jeremy? Yeah. So really I didn't grow up hunting all that much. You know, I went to uh, the rifle camps and whatnot as a child uh, playing sports a lot kind of held me back from that. Uh, I just didn't have time. Um, I'm sure, you know, hockey is very big up here in the North uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin area. So that was pretty much my whole life growing up. You know, I started skating when I was four years old and I stopped, I think when I was 18, mm. uh, actually playing, you know, I still skate now here and there, but, uh, kind of after I decided not to play hockey and pursue it in college, um, you know, I, I kind of felt like something was missing and I had a few buddies that they went to their, their rifle camp with their, their family and stuff. And, you know, my family doesn't have a cabin or a shack or anything like that. So I started going with a family friend of mine and, and kind of got introduced that way um, as far as rifle goes. And then actually funny enough, when I was working at a sporting goods store in college before I left for uh, basic training, I had a friend that hit me up and was like, Hey man, I'm moving to Florida. I know you, you're kind of dabbling with hunting a little more. Would you be interested in buying my bow? And I'm like, yeah, man, uh, how much? And, and he kind of, he gave me a price, which was, fairly cheap and i said yeah i'll take it knew nothing about bows you know gave me a couple arrows and uh that was it my my mom and dad had bought me a target for christmas that year and and then i kind of just started slinging arrows not really knowing what i was doing um but it you know it was kind of nice because you didn't know what was wrong you didn't know what you were doing wrong what what is good what is wrong and and you just kind of had fun you know it was super therapeutic but there comes a time and a place where everybody hits that journey in their archery career and they're like, well, I want to dabble a little more. I want to tinker. I want to find out more in this. So you're on YouTube and podcasts and all that stuff. So, you know, I kind of fell down that rabbit hole a little bit and um, I actually ice fished and open water fish quite a bit and hunting was kind of on the back burner right when I got out of high school. It was more of, you know, I bought a boat, a used boat and uh, I fished all the time and then I kind of was like, started going hunting a little more. And after my first appointment, I had my first hunt out West, which I think was 2018 or 2017, somewhere in there. Uh, my mom lives in Idaho and, um, she set me up with one of her friend's husbands who had lived out there his whole life. And he took me hunting and I didn't know any, you know, I just, I just showed up really. I said, Hey, I got a pretty sweet schedule. I'll take the time off and I'll be there. You just tell me, tell me where to meet you. And we met at a gas station and we hightailed it into the mountains. And I think I saw maybe one elk and, uh, this was in Northern Idaho. So it's super tough country. I would not recommend going there if you're just learning. And, uh, so I went there for rifle actually. And I was under the assumption that my odds would go up with a rifle in my hand. And statistically, it probably does, but I had no idea what I was doing. I had no mapping applications. I had I had nothing. I had just gone to uh, Shields out the Shields Outdoor store, and I bought a pair of Sika pants and a Sika jacket, and I thought I was good to go. And uh, <laughs> I went into the mountains with you know some Merrill tennis shoes and froze my butt off, and but I had a blast. I was I was addicted. And I'm like, I need more of this. So then I went bow hunting the next year and I actually saw less elk. I saw zero. Uh, I heard a couple bugles, but I didn't, again, I didn't know what I was doing. We we're primarily hunting roads, um, which is totally fine. But, you know, we didn't really get off the road. I still didn't have any mapping. I was relying on Google Maps and uh, just kind of winging it and having fun. And then it kind of hit me, you know, like man, I want to have some success. I need to put more effort into this. And I think after that year, which would have been 2019 or 2018, I forget which one. But after that, I was like, you know what? I need to take this serious. If I'm taking work off, spending money, time away from my wife, I want to at least see a little more elk, regardless or not I even get an opportunity. I just want to see an yeah. elk. 
So I, you know, I reached out to a buddy of mine in high school that, that had been elk hunting, kind of the same experience I did, but with a, another person. And, uh, we kind of sat down and just BS and, and we now to this day, that's my elk hunting partner. And, um, our, our stars kind of aligned and we have just always gone together and that's my out West partner. So that was kind of my, my dabble into hunting. Um, and then as the years have gone on, you know, I became more educated in archery. Um, we have a pretty good local shop here in town and, um, you know, meeting the owner and getting real close with him and just, I've been able to help out at the shop too. And he's taught me a lot of things and, um, just like on weekends, you know, once or twice a month, I'll, I'll run the shop while he's off on the weekends. So yeah, it's good, man. It's, you're always learning and, uh, learn something new from somebody every day, you know? So oh, that's sure. kind of my art journey. So yeah, no, for sure. That that's awesome. Uh, starting with rifle and then not, so that, that's something that I, I kind of want to, I guess, hit on with people there is, the elk situation that you see on YouTube is not reality. And there are a few people that express that. Well, um, I feel like, you know, you're, you're really good friends with Dan. Uh, you know, him. he, he seems to be pretty genuine when it comes to letting you know, Hey, this isn't easy. Like I see elk because I'm literally out there 30 plus days a year in the woods. Um, it is something that, that people definitely need to understand. And I feel like in the next couple of years, we'll probably see a die off of people that aren't sticking to getting out for that week that they have during September because they're sick of not seeing anything. And even though they might be running the game plan that they've planned for an entire week, maybe they see, you know, one elk or a small herd or a couple cows or, or nothing uh, for the first couple of years of their hunting experience. And so what got you hooked for the people that might be thinking, well, I need to see an elk to have a good hunt. Um, what got you hooked on those times where you weren't seeing one or you saw the one elk, you froze your butt off, you spent, you know, half your, half your year's worth of money on Sitka pants and jacket that, mm -hmm. <laughs> that first purchase. Uh, what, what, what kept you coming back? Yeah. You know, I think it's, it was just a huge culture shock. Uh, you know, primarily growing up here in the Midwest, it was all hunting in a tree, you know, hunting big woods, seeing very minimal deer growing up as a kid. And even in high school and, and post high school where, you know, I, I bought my first house, I had five acres and it wasn't great hunting land, but I could get into a tree and I could shoot a doe or a spike or a fork every year. And, uh, so that was kind of like, you know, going out there and being able to hike around and move and kind of be in control. I know, I know you're, you're kind of always in control somewhat to an extent, you know, like you control what tree you get in, you control your effort in scouting, you control your effort in the mountains. But I felt like that being in the mountains and being on the hoof, it was easier to control my effort rather than you know, I put up a stand and I run a trail camera and I hope a deer walks by. And if it doesn't, you know, back in my day, that was it. I'd get down and, and go inside and whatnot and, 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 you know, continue to go to that deer stand, continue to hunt, continue to hunt and, you know, not, not put in the scouting effort or not running enough trail cameras, et cetera. But I think what really got me hooked when, when I started elk hunting was like the whole, the whole process, I guess, like, you know, like you said, it's not, it's definitely not easy. And it, it took me years to even figure out and I still don't know what I'm doing, but you know, I, you, every year you grow a little bit, you know, you figure out what you messed up, what you can do better. Uh, even your off season strategies, like what tags can I go after? What resources are, are available that can help me to get these tags or, you know, who can I network with and kind of figure out who's had experiences in what States and whatnot. So I think what got me hooked too was the fitness aspect, you know, like being, if you go into the mountains, not in shape, you're really, I, I believe you're really limiting yourself and sh yeah, you can get it done for sure. But you know, the more in shape you are and the more mental, mentally tough you are, I think it really puts an edge on you. And I like that aspect because it correlated with my job a little bit too. Um, so I think tying everything together, you know, the challenge of elk hunting, 
the fitness aspect, the, the year round preparation and shooting your bow or shooting your rifle, whatever you may hunt with, uh, just kind of tied it all together with me. And it kind of, it broke up the season for me because, you know, whitetail hunting, it can be okay early season, but you know, once you get in that October lull, it, uh, it's tough, man. And for me, it, it, it gave me something to look forward to, whether it was early August or late August and early September into the middle of September or even the end of September. And it allowed me to go into the mountains and hunt and have an adventure and then come home and then really prep for whitetail season or go back out West and hunt mule deer or antelope or elk. I, I don't know. I just think it really opened a lot of doors and, um, over the years, I've been able to to take a lot of time off and really put my effort into hunting. I mean, I don't, we don't take summer trips. We don't really go on vacation. Um, so I kind of put my eggs in one basket. You know, I spend as much time as I can hunt at home when the hunting season isn't going on. But uh, as far as vacation and and time worked and all that stuff, I I put it all in to the fall. So. Yeah, I think I think if you push through your challenges, you know, you'll always get that criticism from your buddies or from your coworkers like, "Oh, another year you didn't kill anything." And it's like, "Well, you know, for a Midwest guy, it's pretty tough to uh unless you go to the same drainages or the the same unit or whatever, every single year you you really you get to learn that unit over and over, right? But yeah. honestly, I don't think I've gone back to the same unit in the same years ever consecutive years I think I've always hunted a new unit or a new state so you know that's a challenge too but at at the end of the day when you're 10 years into your journey you have all these places that you've gone to you know you might have to sacrifice a year and say okay I'm gonna go to you know x y and z unit and put my time in there and if I don't see anything if I if I don't hear an elk if I don't see any elk and pressure's really bad I know I'm probably gonna write that spot off and probably gonna look somewhere else but to have these options, it's just, you know, you might have to eat a tag. So. Yeah, no, for sure. <clears throat> and that, I think you highlighted it really well. It does. A lot of people get hooked on the work. A lot of people get hooked on the, uh, the adventure behind coming out West and, you know, going whitetail hunting for the first time this year. Uh, it, it was, well, I guess technically I've gone before, but with a tag in my pocket and a, and an actual bow in my hand rather than a, a rifle it was a different experience because like you said, yeah, you can pick a tree and yes, you are in charge of that. But once you're in that tree for that sit, you can't get down. You can't move. If you see deer over there, you can't go get them. You have to hope that they come this way. And if you put a trail cam up, you have to hope the deer pass by it. They could walk behind the tree on the other side. And, and so I get what you're saying as far as being in control when you're out elk hunting or mule deer hunting out here out West it's all in like how you can get to from point A to point B the quickest possible and the most strategic possible with the wind and, you know, being line of sight and everything like that with the animal. So it's definitely two different styles of hunting. And, and I can see how, um, you know, being, you can get hooked on the fact that you can control a lot more of the variables in a Western style hunt rather than, you know, sitting in a stand and, and hoping that your scouting was good and that today the stars aligned and the moon phase was right and the acorns dropped in the right place and like all the all the things aligned perfectly so that that buck walked within 20 yards of your stand. Uh, you know, that that's that's definitely a, it's a different style of stress and, and uh, preparation for sure. So, mm -hmm. you know, with with that being said, how many years did it take you to kill your first elk? Mm. four mm -hmm. and that was with a bow correct the idaho twice and then montana and then montana i killed my first cow elk in montana with a rifle mm -hmm. um so yeah i mean it took a little bit of time and i don't know i'm not a per se trophy hunter or a selective right. Per se, uh, I wanted to get one under my belt, get reps in the red zone and whatnot. So um, that year we had hunted uh, the breaks and we were able to go back on a general rifle tag and uh, went to an area with a buddy that had been there before. And we kind of all just split up and we all filled our tags and it was a great year. We had a good snow year. 
Uh, I had been out there too when it's 75 and sunny and no snow and it was super tough, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. To me, I knew, you know, I, I understood elk hunting and I knew it was going to take a while. You know, you can get lucky, but I'm, I don't have good luck when it comes to, uh, getting lucky woods. Uh, but you know, I definitely have gotten lucky, but it's not consistently, so, I mean, it, it definitely took a while and, uh, and that's not even, you know, there's, there's people that don't kill for 10 years and that's totally cool. It's tough. There's some years where, you know, you're snake bit and you can't kill a thing and it's not, maybe, maybe you don't miss or whatever. It's just a lack of, it's an odd year or whatever. I, I mean, I rode that wave for two years, whitetail hunting the last two years, it's been just I haven't got lucky. I haven't found that buck. I haven't, you know, that mature buck didn't walk by my stand or, you know, I had a bull at 70 yards that wouldn't give me a shot or I couldn't get any closer, you know, stuff just happens and you can only control what you can control. So, but yeah, I I would Mm -hmm. say, you know, to anybody that's kind of pondering the thought of going back out West or, or continuing hunting, man, it's, you got to put in the time and you got to grind and, and, you know, it'll come together at one point, but, um, just be okay. You know, I, I, you know, there's people that will give you crap or, or give you grief of not filling tags. But at the end of the day, man, you're experiencing stuff that, you know, one to 2% of people ever get to experience. So just being in the mountains and, and finding new spots and learning new country, learning, how animals react, whether you're whitetail hunting or elk hunting or mill deer hunting, you know, you just have to keep at it and eventually the stars will come together. But yeah, so it, it, it took me four years, but, um, my buddy and I shot one the third year, um, we ever went elk hunting and he pulled the trigger that time. He was the shooter that day and, and we, he killed the bull at, about a hundred yards with a rifle. So, um, that was my first experience. And then the following year I shot mine. So, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. So that, and that's just, again, to put it into perspective for people, three years for your buddy. And again, if you're going with people like have that conversation ahead of time, who's going to be shooter, who's going to be caller. If you guys are splitting that up or at least who is the shooter that day. Uh, so there aren't any arguments up on the mountain about those kind of things. Those usually, don't turn out very nice uh, and and you can lose friendships over that. So communication is key if you're going to go hunt with somebody. But uh, with, with that being said, you know, you went with a a bow and a rifle throughout those four years, you mixed it up and it took you four years to, to kill uh, an elk. And that seems to be pretty common. Uh, It's not usual for people to go out the first year and kill an elk. And, and so just again, for people that are either Midwest or Eastern that are coming out West for a hunt, don't get discouraged if the first couple of years you're not getting in on elk every single day. It takes a while to figure that out. And even people that live out West, um, you know, I don't get nearly as much time to put boots on the ground as far as scouting goes to go chase elk and figure things out as I would like to, because you have job, family, other obligations going on throughout the year. So you kind of pick an area, you e scout it the best that you can and you go and you experience it when you're there and hopefully you have enough plans that eventually you can be mobile enough to get to a spot where you're in elk. But, uh, it's, it's just something that, you know, you gotta be persistent. You gotta be persistent and consistent with your effort, uh, and not letting things like that discourage you of not killing of the first second or even third year that you're out there. Um, yeah. And, know, and one thing more to add is just me personally, how I viewed it was like, I don't have nobody to impress other than my wife and maybe you have kids uh, if you're listening to this or maybe you have one on the way, but really at the end of the day, man, that's all that matters is, is your, your personal life and and your family. I mean, if Joe Schmo says, Oh, you didn't kill another elk this year, uh, another year wasted, who cares? You have nobody to impress you. You're out there learning, man. It takes a while. It's like, it's like learning a job or anything in life that you don't just pick it up. And like you said, you can get lucky, but, just, just keep after it, man. It'll, it'll come together at one point. So. Yeah. Yeah. And the only, honestly, for me personally, cause you hear that and you, you know, you take time off, your boss is going to ask you and then people around work are going to know. And, uh, none of that really bothered me. What, what really kind of would sting more is knowing that my kids were going to ask 
<laughs> if I got anything when I got home, <laughs> that mm-hmm. was usually my, my kind of the, the sting whenever they're like, all right, dad, what would you get this time? We're like, oh, yeah. nothing today. Why do you keep going? You could stay and sleep in and, and, and yeah. snuggle us and do all the, you know, the normal kid stuff. And it, it stings a little bit when you realize you're taking that time. But at the mm-hmm. same time, when you do come back or you start getting your kids involved, uh, that's another thing too, is get your kids out there. Uh, get them glassing with you, get them out there hiking, get them seeing animals. I mean, this last time I went up, uh, I took my son and uh, he's nine and he glassed up a buck before I saw it up on the hillside. (laughs) I'm not, I'm not deer hunting right now, but he was like, Hey dad, is that a, is that an elk? And I was like, no, that's a, that's a mule deer, but he saw it before I did. So that, you know, of course I made sure to highlight that boost his ego a little bit, like, (laughs) Hey, you're better glassing than dad. But uh, make it fun and exciting for the kids. If you have kids out there so that they get involved and they're not, um, razzing you too much when you, when you come home <laughs> without right. anything. <laughs> uh, but this year you had a pretty big year. You've killed two bucks so far. Yeah. Two bucks, uh, one in North Dakota, one in Wisconsin, and then a bull in New Mexico. Wow. So yeah, been a pretty good year. Uh, all archery, um, you know, this doesn't happen to me every year, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. It just, I, uh, I did some stuff to my property here in Wisconsin that I think helped a little bit. And, uh, yeah, it was just, I ultimately picked the right tree that day in North Dakota. Um, I have a, a crew that we usually go out every year during the rut and, you know, get an Airbnb or hotel and spend time, kind of have our little deer camp out there. And, uh, we just have some properties we've hunted over the years and um we kind of all just split up share intel and whatnot and um yeah stars just aligned that day for me but yeah it's it was a good year new mexico was really good um yeah and i got i did go antelope hunting this year um did not kill i was only out there for opening weekend and i had to rush home so I only got a couple days to hunt. We kind of had a, a curveball thrown, so I had to make it home in time to be home with my wife. And uh, yeah, it was it was good. I mean, I knew my odds probably weren't very good uh, where I was in Montana for antelope. Uh, it was a pretty mediocre tag, I would say. I didn't, I didn't, wasn't sitting on a ton of points or anything. Just kind of threw my name in the hat because I wanted an antelope tag and thought I had a little more time, but you know, put in my best effort and didn't didn't come out successful. So yeah, that was kind of my season. It's still, you know, I still have one more white tail tag, but we'll see what happens. Yeah, no, for sure. So, so, let, so you've killed a, you killed a bull, you killed two bucks and uh, you went after antelope. What would be your favorite, I guess, uh, what's your favorite meat, your favorite game meat that you've had? Mm, you know, this is going to sound weird, but I actually don't have like a favorite meat. I like, we kind of rotate between venison, elk and antelope. You know, I've only killed one antelope in my life. Uh, I just kind of started hunting them not too long ago and it's getting freaking hard to get a tag. Uh, I have gone bow hunting on a, on an archery only antelope tag. And, uh, my first year I missed one, misranged them and shot way under them. And uh, second year after that, I shot one with a rifle. And then last year I did not antelope hunt. And this year I went out for two days and um, I went out solo. So it was, it was a tough gas bill to swallow. So I think uh, solo hunting from here on out is going to be a lot harder to do uh, just because I live so far from any Western state. So going out there and, and, you know, assuming I have multiple hunts in the year, um, if it was my only hunt, I would, I would, I wouldn't hesitate going, but, um, just having, you know, three, four trips a year, you know, gas can add up and it's, it's tough. So, Mm -hmm. but yeah, I, going back to your question, man, I I love it all. I love antelope. It's good because I think it's because we don't have it as often, but I like venison and I love elk. So. That's awesome. What's, what's your favorite dish to cook with game meat? Hmm. That's a good question. You know, I think, I think a backstrap, a smoked backstrap, or maybe a reverse seared backstrap with like a red potato 
I don't think you can go wrong there or like uh, throw a little butter on it. Uh, classic we always do is like um, elk fajitas or deer fajitas um, or even antelope fajitas. Um, tacos are super simple. Uh, we, I don't know. We don't really, we used to cook a lot more and I think it's maybe because I cook a lot at work and I don't enjoy it as much at home. But uh, <laughs> I don't know. Simplicity is pretty much what we do, you know, whether it's, throwing something on the grill real quick or like, you know, throwing something in a pan, frying it up like taco meat or something like that. But yeah, I don't know. We we're pretty simple, man. Rice, potatoes, meat, and uh, some sort of veggie usually, but yeah, we don't get too crazy. I like it. I like How about it. you? Well, uh, that's a good question. Cause uh, I I'm pretty simple as well. I like a good roast, um, mm -hmm. especially for like meal prepping. Cause steaks are really good. Cause I like a good medium rare steak, but once you have to warm it back up in the microwave, it gets a little too well. So I, you know, I'll eat a warmed up steak, but I prefer steak like fresh yeah. but for, for meal prepping purposes. You can't beat roast in my opinion, and you get to change it however you want roast or chili. Um, those are my two favorite, especially, and maybe that's just cause it's getting cooler now. And that's what I'm thinking of right now. But, mm -hmm. uh, I really like, there's a, there's a recipe. I want to say it's called a Mississippi roast mm -hmm. that I tried uh, beginning of this year for the first time. And I'm going to do it again with some of the whitetail that I brought home. And uh, it's just, it's a, it's a different kind of roast that has like actual, it's got pepperoncinis in it, yep. which I've never seen that in a roast before. And that, I love that. It's got just enough <laughs> spice to it to where it's good. It's not your typical classic roast with the potatoes and the carrots. Um, and it'll go great over rice. It'll go great over potatoes, mashed potatoes, red potatoes, whatever you want. Uh, you pick the side dish um, or even just some good grilled up green beans or asparagus or whatever. Just put the roast over top of that. And it's just it's mm -hmm. great with everything. So, but I agree. Fajitas are another good one too. Fajitas and tacos. Mm -hmm. um, that's definitely, those are definitely go-tos as well. So, uh, but yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. I keep things simple. I don't go too crazy over the top. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a time thing for me, really. I, I mean, by the time, you know, the, the day's settled or whatever, depending on what I'm doing the time of year, but like right now, and I'm trying to kill a whitetail late season, it's like you get home at six o'clock ish. And, you know, if I didn't prepare now, I got, you know, to spend another hour, hour and a half cooking mm -hmm. when I just want to kind of relax or figure out what I'm going to do the next day. But yeah, I actually have a roast in right now. Uh, I've been kind of doing, uh, a barbecue kind of a barbecue ciabatta sandwich and then okay. taking that meat you know putting the sauce on on your sandwich and not mixing it while it's cooking and then taking the leftovers and doing like street tacos super awesome. simple quick easy like you said meal prep so yeah and for time purposes too like with a roast if you're tired you just throw all the ingredients mm. in a pot a crock pot let it slow cook overnight in the morning throw it in some tupperware you're good to go. Like it's not, it's very much a, once you put the ingredients all together, just leave it and just let it go. You don't have to sit there and baby it or is it overcooked? Is it undercooked? It's just leave it for a couple hours in a crock pot and you're good to go. So yeah, yeah. roast is roast is good. And that's a good option too. do some street tacos with the leftovers. Um, mm. Man, I'm hungry. <laughs> uh, so with, with that being said, so you killed, you killed a bull. Did you drive to New Mexico? Yep. So we had a quick little synopsis. So my, I drew a first season tag and my buddy who I hunt with out West, he drew a second season tag. So we mm. had, we had two tags in New Mexico on different seasons, which I think we were gone 25 ish days, I think. So we were planning on being gone a full month with driving and whatnot. And, uh, we both tagged out Well, we were there regardless of mine. You know, I, if we, I tagged out and we still had to kill eight days before his hunt, but he tagged out on day one. And, you know, we, once we got everything processed and loaded up, we were home. So, but yeah, we drove down. It was 21 hours. I want to say something like that. We did it in two days That's and long drive. Yeah, it was, it, it's not a fun one either. It's through the Midwest. Uh, you go through Western Kansas, which is not good for the eyes, uh, Oklahoma panhandle, and then down in New Mexico. So it's a lot of prairies, a lot of flat, a lot of egg, a lot of cows. So, yeah. yeah. 
but yeah, there's we really did nothing to see in Kansas in August, and then uh, you know came home the end of September. So, oh, that's awesome. That's really mm-hmm. cool. Yeah, it's uh, it's really it's really interesting to hear. You know, a lot of people drive, a lot of people fly. I guess it's kind of a mix, but um, I if I can, I prefer to drive because then I can have all my gear with me. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's hard to want to fly with stuff, and especially like there's always the chance of something getting lost. Uh, and you know, I, I flew out for the whitetail hunt and they lost my bow for a day. Mm. Um, and it wasn't technically lost. They knew what airport it was at. It just wasn't yeah. with me, which sure. is frustrating because you lose hunt time if you don't mm-hmm. have your bow. And it's not something like if they lose another bag, you can go purchase other clothing that reimburse you. Like a bow is dialed into you. You've been shooting that bow. You've got it ready for the hunt. That's, that's a frustrating scenario to be in. So, um, mm. You know, definitely, I definitely understand people that drive, you know, for those kinds of hunts and uh, then being able to pack the meat back too. Uh, that's the other thing that, you know, you got to find a way to be able to send it back. Luckily with the white tail for me, I only killed a doe. So it was like, I think I got, ju- it was just under 50 pounds of boned out meat um, that we got. And so after we, I, I think we ate like one of the back straps and some of the tenderloins, but um flying it back i just duct taped a a walmart cooler and flew that back like a checked bag but don't forget guys don't forget i'm going to do this little brief interruption here it's a great conversation so far but here on the youtube channel if you're listening to this on the audio only version go over to youtube and subscribe once we hit 10,000 subscribers i'm building out a bow completely with all the accessories that i use from aftermarket strings to the stabilizers to the site that i use and more. Guys, you don't want to miss out on this. Once we hit 10,000 subscribers on YouTube, I will be building out a bow for you to use hunting at Total Archery Challenge, Mountain Archery Fest, shooting with your friends, shooting in your backyard, in your garage, and just a brand new setup for you. So subscribe. Thank you so much for the support, guys. Have a fantastic day. Let's get back to it with Jeremy. Uh, An elk would be a little bit more difficult to get back home, a little bit more pricey for sure. So yeah, there's always, oh, there's pros and cons to flying and driving. Mm-hmm, for sure. And then with whitetail hunting. So talk to us a little bit about, so you killed a big buck in uh, North Dakota. Uh, and then you killed one in, in uh, Wisconsin. So mm-hmm. what was this like a uh, walk us through kind of your, your idea. So you, you transitioned from elk to white back to whitetail. And, uh, did you have like a target buck? Did you just have like a bare minimum that you won't shoot anything under? Um, how did that work? I guess on your Wisconsin property, which is closer to you. And then, uh, with, with North Dakota as well. Yeah. So we got out of elk season, which ended the end of September. And then I had, I want to say it was about five or six days. Um, I went out to North Dakota and I hunted mule deer. And then from there, I went out to Montana and hunted the opener uh, for antelope. And then I had to be home that Monday. So I hunted, I think, four days in North Dakota, traveled to Montana, and then hunted out there for two days. And then I left Sunday night, which was opening weekend, came home for, I had to be home Monday. So yeah, so for after that hunt, it was whitetail season, and usually I don't, like like we talked about before, I don't really spend a lot of time early season because I'm worried about elk or, or deer, whatever I got a tag for. And uh, I, I do a lot of summer scouting. I wouldn't say I'm crazy on it, but I do try and get a uh, an inventory of what bucks are around or what area that I'm allotted to hunt, kind of what's living around there, what the doe numbers look like. And uh, I do a lot of prep here on my property, um, putting in food plots and kind of just bettering the habitat around me. And uh, we don't have a ton of food around. Uh, We have primarily hay fields. So, you know, having good food for deer is, I think, crucial. Uh, Whether, I mean, I only have 10 acres too, so it's not, I'm not hunting a giant property. And my property is primarily set up for kind of a rut corridor kind of holding does on my food plot and you know hoping a buck comes in or or I have it set up to where if I have a north wind you know I should have bucks cruising the wood line scent checking does 
And uh, I have a, if I have a south wind, I can slip in the back of the wood line and kind of hunt the box in the woods. Um, so yeah, I, all summer, you know, spent, spent a lot of time prepping for, for whitetail here in Wisconsin and then kind of scouting in Minnesota as well. And, uh, I don't really hunt my property here unless I have a buck that I want to hunt. Um, previous years I've taken a doe or two, or my wife will go out and shoot a doe with her bow and, we kind of stopped doing that. Just I've been able to get a couple permission pieces and that have high dole population. So we'll go out there and try and kill one. But yeah, pretty much it started this summer. And then I, I, I have all cell cams back on my property and I don't, I don't go back there unless I have to. So I knew a buck was in the area. He wasn't living on my property by any means. I just don't have the space for a mature buck, but you know, I knew I was hopeful that he would come around during the rut and, and kind of chase some does around. But yeah, so he started to kind of make a presence middle of October, you know, still walking at night. And after we had one good cold front in the middle of October and he started to show up a little more and more still it wasn't legal shooting light or anything. And, you know, I was watching from afar, watching cameras. And I, like I said, I don't go back there for anything. And, and we can bait here in Wisconsin, where, where I live in the County. And, uh, I, I stopped baiting cause a lot of people bait around here. And I think it really messes up your deer movement personally. Um, you get a lot, a lot of nocturnal bucks. Yeah. You get the does that come into bait, but from my experience, I don't have bucks chasing does on a corn pile or an apple pile or anything like that. So, um, I don't bait just primarily rely on food plots and a good wind and just making it security for them. So, um, towards the end of October, I think it was about the 29th or the 28th. He started to come around a little more and more. He started to become a little more patternable. And when I say patternable, I don't mean like he comes to my food plot exactly at six thirty or five thirty every day. I mean, right. I more or less mean like, he's in the area. I'm patterning him on his movement, whether or not he crosses my food plot or maybe he stays in the woods, but he's around. So I, I was watching him and I think it was October 30th. He showed up in my food plot at last light, like, you know, a minute or two left. And he was in my wood line, you know, 20 minutes before that chasing a doe around. So historically um, I had killed a buck on Halloween my first year I lived here and oh, awesome. that was the first day I hunted this year it was Halloween. I went in the stand about two o'clock and I hunted two and a half hours, maybe three hours. And he came around and he kind of skirted the edge of my food plot. He didn't come in the food plot, but I think he was sent checking does on a North wind. And, uh, I could hear, I couldn't see him when he came in, he was kind of in this buck brush but I could hear him scraping and, and thrashing every single branch, but I didn't know it was him. You know, there was a couple other smaller bucks around, but um, I stood up and grabbed my bow and, and, you know, peeked my head around the tree. I'm at, I'm usually set up in a big pine, so I have good cover and I saw his white neck. So I, I knew it was a deer, but I didn't know for sure it was a buck. Figured it was the way I could hear everything playing out. And, uh, he kind of stood there in a little, before he crossed a little opening of like CRP grass, he stood there and just stared and kind of scanned the whole area to see what was around. If he could hear anything, you know, stuff mature bucks do. And, uh, I ranged the tree that was in front of him to kind of get an area of where he was going to go. And as soon as I saw his main beam and it kind of, you know, it curled in. So I knew it was a mature buck, but I, I wasn't a hundred percent sure it was him, but I knew it was a mature buck. So I drew back on him and I actually didn't get a great look at his rack, but I knew it was, it was a shooter. So I stopped him. I shot him and uh, I hit him high. He, uh, he ducked my string just a tad and I thought I hit him good, but you know, I gave him two, three hours and we went out and kind of tracked a little bit, had good blood. And then 
slowly died off and we got an early snow and then it kind of got warm again. So the snow was melting. It wasn't great tracking conditions. And, uh, I called a buddy of mine who runs a tracking dog and he came in with his dog the next day. We ran the dog and he got on his track and he crossed the road and went onto a neighbor's property and, you know, got permission from him and whatnot. And we tracked that deer for probably 500 yards or so. And he, hmm. he goes, you know, I think this buck's alive. I think you had a lot of blood because of your broadhead. I said, I don't know, man. I think I hit him liver, if anything, and uh, high liver. And he said, no, I think this buck's alive. And I said, all right, well, so he called it, he called the track. And then I went home and my neighbor came over and said, man, I got that buck on camera this morning. And I said, oh, so he's still alive. And he said, yeah. And I said, all right, well, let me know if you, if you get him again on camera or, or if you start seeing him again or whatever. I said, all right, sounds good. And so I, the next day I boogied to North Dakota and hunted out there. I shot a buck, I think on the third day we were there or something like that. And as soon as I took that buck to a processor out there, because you can't, you know, transferring the, the deer from state to state, you got to get rid of the carcass and get the brain out and all that. So we yeah. usually use a processor out there if we can, just to get rid of the carcass and, and get it all scun out and, and get the brain out. But anyways, as soon as I dropped him off, my neighbor had texted me and he said, hey, man, uh, I found your buck in the river. And I was mm. like, no way. And he said, yep. And everybody knew about this buck. All my neighbors knew about yeah. him. So he said, yep, I, I, he's dead down in the river. Come and get him. And I said, uh, I'm in North Dakota. I'll be home Sunday. I'll be there Sunday morning. And, uh, yeah, I went and picked him up. And, you know, obviously the meat was spoiled. And, you know, it's not a way you want to find your deer. But I'm glad the story ended. It's not the way I wish it ended. But I'm glad I have closure on it. And, you know, I was able to kill him. I don't know. Okay. I think he's. I think he was alive for a day or two, maybe even longer. I think those bucks they go a lot longer if they if you get a bad hit. Uh, I think when they're in the ruts, they're just their adrenaline is so high. I think it takes them a couple more days to die, rather than maybe you hit them earlier late season. Mm. Uh, that's just my opinion, whether or not I'm right or wrong. Uh, but yeah, found him, and then you know, circling back to North Dakota, went out there, and uh, day one we got there about noonish or so. And I climbed into a tree. I saw one buck, um, little fork didn't shoot him. And then the next day, uh, my buddy and I had met with a farmer that was going to give us permission on some of his properties. And, uh, we kind of scouted that day. And then we had a guy in camp that killed a buck. So we helped him get him out while all our other guys in camp were hunting. And then the following day, uh, that was the morning I killed my buck, which was opening rifle. So they have a weird season. So like their rifle hunts start at noon, same with like archery. So on the 1st of September, archery opens at noon and usually the date changes, but their rifle season opens whatever day at noon. So I wanted to hopefully get one shot before rifle started kicking off and, uh, killed one that morning, saw a lot of good bucks, um, for whatever reason. I don't know if it was that morning, the rut really turned on, um, I screwed up on a good buck that morning. I, I was in a saddle and I spun around and put my back against the tree because they came in off my off shooting side. And as mm. I did that, my carabiner hit the tree and, you know, they all spooked. Mm. So I was kind of down, you know, and then they all came back. I mean, it was like I was sitting there. It was complete silence. And then all of a sudden, like four does come freaking hammering in full on sprint so I stood up and I'm like, okay, there's, there's gotta be a buck, you know, chasing them. And there was like three or four different bucks in that, that group that came in and I ended up shooting the bigger one and he went 15, 20 yards and stood there and just tipped. So that was, that was super nice to see after shooting, you know, my buck in Wisconsin and not finding him right away that, you know, that really stung. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> it, uh, it made me, you know, I didn't, I don't think I went hunting the next couple of days. I was just so down yeah. and, you know, it really, it really makes you question your, your ability to kill something. So, but yeah, I don't know. You put it behind you and, you know, keep pressing on and control what you can control. So, well, and yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Cause you know, I had a situation last year and for people that listen to the podcast, you know, I'm repeating the story, but, uh, I mean, I, have, man, I can't believe it was already a year ago. This blows my mind. I swear the older you get, 
the faster time goes and my just mm-hmm. quick rundown on my theory on that is because it becomes a smaller percentage of your life every year becomes a smaller percentage of your life so it seems to go faster it's like a an illusion almost but that's why for like a two-year-old five minutes is an eternity where they're at whereas for us it's like the blink of an eye it's been five minutes so anyway uh with with last year um i shot a buck and i felt like it was a good shot uh i didn't have anyone with me and uh it was kind of a further shot it was like a 70 yard downhill shot i don't know what it is with me and 70 yard downhill shots but that that's how i killed my elk this year too so uh <laughs> last year i hit this 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 buck and he wasn't anything huge but um he was my first buck with a bow and it was a little bit further back than i would have liked so it sounds similar to your shot and I watched all these deer file out of the draw and I was like, well, maybe I had a clean miss. I never found my arrow. Uh, and I walked around, followed tracks, didn't see any blood. We had just had some fresh snow. So I was like, if, if I hit him, like he should be bleeding. Right. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and I could have sworn I saw the fletchings bury in him, but I was like, maybe that was just me misimagining his mule kick and everything. I was like, maybe it's just, you know, me hopeful. Anyway, a couple days, uh, it was like two weeks later, a buddy of mine was up hunting that draw and he had no idea I'd shot one. And uh, he texted me. He was like, Hey, so um, he said, I just found this. I just found this buck. Uh, it looks like a really bad shot. And I was like, Oh no. And so he showed me the picture it was the exit hole. And he, I guess what had happened was he was quartered way harder towards me than I thought. Mm-hmm. And it, it had just like zipped right through him. And, um, and the guts, I guess, had plugged the exit hole. So that's why I didn't bleed. And then me being higher than him, he couldn't bleed out the entry hole, which was, I clipped the lung, went through the liver and then out the, so it was super hard quarter towards me. And, uh, it, it's a hard feeling because it's like, you know, you out of morals, you know, you tag that buck, you killed that buck. Right. Uh, but you lose the meat. Um, and, and it, it, it kind of makes you train well you can go two ways i feel like it makes you either question like what you're saying how capable you are or it can turn you into training better training for those scenarios a lot better and uh i you know i it seems like you take it that way as well and i i would challenge people that you know don't just shrug it off but use it as a as an experience because you bow hunt enough you're going to hit something there's going to be something that happens, whether that there's a branch, a wind, uh, something happens that just the arrow just deflects off of something, whatever, or you just have your adrenaline pumping super heavy. And you know, that's something you can train for, I guess, but everything else, there's going to be something that happens where you hit an animal poorly. And, uh, it's just a matter of how you treat that scenario. You tracked it for days, literally, um, Mm -hmm. hired a tracking dog you know, it's just put the effort in and then aim to get better. Like it's just going to happen and don't, yeah. don't beat yourself up over it. Learn from it. Yeah. I think honestly, the reason I was so down was just so much preparation goes into the year. Um, all the hard work you put in all summer to make your property better, all the scouting, mm. all the money you spend on trail cameras and gear and, you know, bows and, and time away from your family. And then you get one chance and you screw it up, Mm -hmm. you know, whether, like you said, wind, bad shot, animal ducks, animal moves, whatever. I think that's what kind of sat with me wrong. It was like, man, all the, you know, you put in the time, you know, you put in the work and then something goes still wrong. And that's, that's why I love bow hunting is just, Mm. it's so difficult. And no matter how hard you work, or how things go, you know, you may still not be successful, even if you did everything right, you know, that's just, that's bow hunting. And I think that's why everybody loves it. So. Yeah. It's a problem though. When you, when it becomes consistently that you're, you're a poor shot, then then Mm -hmm. there's a problem, but every once in a while it's going to happen and you just, you you handle it the way that you need to handle it and train to be better. So uh, I guess kind of the, to, to wrap things up here for, for people, uh, you coming out West from a Midwest guy. And then even, well, I don't even want to go down that road. Cause we hear that all the time. Um, I I'd rather talk about why is fitness such a big deal for you? Even if elk hunting wasn't a thing for you and before elk hunting, I mean, you were a fit dude, you, you got your workouts in, you enjoyed fitness. 
why is fitness a big deal for you when it comes to if we were to just talk to whitetail hunters um, or people in general? Why is why is fitness important for you? Yeah, I don't. I think it's just it's not even like important. Like obviously it's important, but now it's like I've just been doing it so long to where it's just it's just discipline and I wouldn't even call it discipline actually i'd call it more like a lifestyle like mm. it's non-negotiable like it's just a it's a routine you know like i i started actually taking exercising serious probably around ninth or ninth or tenth grade um when i kind of figured you know okay hockey's my thing i want to go to the next level um how do i separate myself right and you know i put in a lot of time and effort into summer training and, you know, skating and, um, just putting hours into the gym. And over time, you know, you develop these skills and you develop movements and, and, uh, you develop discipline and, and mental fortitude and all this stuff. And I think that just carried on with me throughout, you know, post high school and all that. And there was a time where, you know, I was doing, you know, quote unquote CrossFit or, uh, Olympic lifting or hit, whatever you want to call it. Um, in high school before CrossFit was really even a thing. Uh, we were just doing that because that's, that's how athletes trained, you know, all Olympic movements and high intensity workouts and all that stuff. And once I kind of hung up the skates, it was like, all right, I'm going to, I joined a traditional, um, big box gym and went there, you know, with a 24 hour pass and, and did bro lifts. And that was, totally fine, you know, but it was kind of like, I got bored. Um, so then my wife actually got back and she got, she started like kind of dabbling with CrossFit and I was actually overseas and she had, you know, Oh, I love it. And I, I like the community aspect of the gym and all this stuff. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to get back into it. So I started doing that again. And then it's kind of developed over the years. Like I would say I'm more a hybrid kind of training perspective right now. You know, I do dabble. I do a lot of Olympic lifting still. I do bodybuilding. Uh, I run quite a bit in the summertime. Um, I do rucks, you know, kind of touch every single aspect of fitness I can to kind of make myself, you know, one healthy, but two, like an asset for my job. And then that all correlates into elk hunting, you know, like uh, being a firefighter, I think correlates with elk hunting, you know, just the kind of movements we do, whether it's you're, you're climbing a high rise building or you need to go upstairs or you're moving hose or you're throwing ladders, whatever it may be. Uh, it kind of all correlates with the same muscles as elk hunting does in my opinion. So, you know, if I hit the local ski hill and, and throw, you know, 50 pounds in my pack and go up and down, up and down, up and down, you know, not only am I getting the lungs ready and the legs ready to go out West, but I'm also benefiting from it from at work. And, you know, my, my big, I, my goal and my kind of like my lifestyle that I live by is like, you know, elk hunting's great. Hunting's great. Right. Like that's my passion. But at the end of the day, like I have a job to do and it's not elk hunt. Like elk hunting doesn't pay my bills. It actually puts me back from my bills. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, like I work for a city department that people rely on me. People rely on my crew and they call us for the the worst day of their life so if i'm not physically fit to do my job you know how why am i here so i take that i'm pretty prideful in that and obviously it correlates to hunting but yeah, yeah. you know i don't i don't train just for elk hunting i don't train for just the mountains i train like i said it's a routine now it's so routine where you wake up and you're like, all right, what am I doing today in the gym? Or what time am I going to be able to work out today? There's no, you know, I don't go years without working out. It's just, it's just kind of within our family. My wife works out a lot. Um, I'm surrounded by friends that really enjoy fitness and, you know, we're able to make some moves in our life early in the year where we're able to buy a home gym and that's really helped too. So, yeah, I don't, it's just a priority, man. It's just making time for it, whether, you know, maybe you don't have time in your day and you have to get up an hour or two early. You know, I've had that where I look at my training schedule at work and I'm like, man, it's going to be tough to get it in. And I'm not a huge guy that 
I don't like working out at night as much as I do in the mornings. Um, so I know there's negotiation time, right? Come after dinner at the fire station. I'm like, eh, I'm full now. Or like, I don't really want to work out. I want to watch a movie with the guys or maybe we're, you know, playing a game or cards or whatever it may be. Well, now I just blew working out off. So, you know, I look at the schedule and whether that's, you know, your daily life or whatever, and you see a gap, well, go fill it. You know, if you got to get up at four or five, go do it. Even if it's simple as walking, man, like in November, I don't, I don't hit weights as hard in November as I do all year, just because mm-hmm. I'm out scouting and walking so many miles every day to where, yeah, I'll still lift, you know, but I don't, I wouldn't say it's as prevalent as it usually is in the year, but yeah, I don't know. I think too, switching it up, you know, trying different programs, trying a different style of fitness can keep people kind of interested in it rather than doing the same thing over and over and over. But yeah, I don't know, man. I think it's just, it's just who I am. It's kind of how I grew up, you know, and and my dad wasn't a super big weight guy by any means. I've never seen my dad work out ever. And maybe that's the way I am because of that. Or, you know, my mom was fairly healthy growing up. And I, I think that, you know, contributed to the way I am now. But um, yeah, I think, I think if you have the means to work out, you should, you know, I definitely agree with that. Mm -hmm. I think, And I couldn't have said it better. I love that. It's not just about hunting for you. It's about taking care of your family, providing, uh, you know, paying the bills, making sure that your, your job is taken care of in turn, taking care of your community. Uh, and then, you know, down the road, you're going to have a son or a daughter. Uh, Mm -hmm. I don't know which one you're having, but either way, you're having a child that you're going to be, uh, you're going to be setting the example for, and you're going to be putting, you're, you're changing your, your, your line, your generational line by uh, setting that habit now and, and making that a priority so that your children and your grandchildren also see that and see the benefit of it as things become more and more sedentary and easy to get to. You don't even have to go to the store anymore. You can order your groceries. You can buy everything online. You don't even have to get up to go shopping. You can work from home. You can order everything from home. So it, it's definitely important for uh, for us and our longevity to be able to continue to move and to lift, you know, heavy things uh, at distance, you know, depending on whatever your goals are. But uh, I, I definitely, definitely love what you said there. And uh, it definitely correlates over into hunting, whether you're whitetail hunting or elk hunting, mule deer hunting, whatever, it, antelope hunting, uh, whatever it is, definitely make sure that you're getting after and, and moving. So. Uh, with that being said, Jeremy, thank you so much for your time. Do you want to, is there anything else that we haven't touched on that you want to leave with the audience? No, I think that's, I think we covered a good variety of things. Just, uh, you know, if I had to give any advice for somebody out there, just, you know, work hard, put in your time and good things will come. Uh, like I said, it took me a while to kill an elk. It took me, took me a while to kill a good buck, a whitetail buck and, you know, I still, there's things I haven't killed yet that I would love to kill, but I'm still learning. So yeah, just keep after it and, you know, live your life. Exactly. No, I love that. Thank you so much. And then Jeremy, if people want to find you, reach out to you, ask you questions, whether it be about uh, maybe they're getting into firefighting or uh, training for that uh, hunting, whitetail hunting up in Wisconsin or wherever it is, where, uh, where can they reach out to you at? Uh, I would say probably Instagram um, at Jeremy Ryan zero zero seven. It's probably the best way to get a hold of me. And speaking about firefighting, I want to touch on that just one sec. Yeah. Uh, maybe you have an audience that is looking for a career change, or uh, maybe they've dabbled with the fire service or whatever, um, or maybe they just want to hunt as much as they can, but still, you know, get paid and all that. So I would. If if I were talking to a group like that, I would recommend looking into the fire service. Even you know, even if you don't want to do it full time, you can do it part time. You can volunteer. Uh, it's super rewarding. You learn a lot of things, and if you do it full time as a career, you get a lot of time off. People don't realize how much time off of work you get. You know, you're not going to be a millionaire being a firefighter, but you know, typically a lot of places they give you a pension. They give you a lot of vacation. You work an odd schedule. So you are away from your family for 24 hours typically. But 
when the time comes to go hunting, you know, taking five days off of work for you maybe is five days, right? Well, if I take five days off, that's 21 days. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of good things. If you're, if you want to hunt more, you know, a lot of people think, Oh, I need to join the outdoor industry. I need to work for a a backpack company or a a bow company or whatever. And that's just, that's not the case, man. I, I would go the opposite way, join law enforcement, join the fire service, join something where you have a lot of time off paid time off and, uh, go chase your passion. So if, and we're hurting, you know, nationwide, whether it's police or fire, even the trades, man, look into that if you're if you're looking for a career change so i would definitely definitely agree with that <clears throat> and uh getting into the industry is definitely not the best way to get more hunting time yeah <laughs> uh, that is that is you, you can talk to anyone if you like shooting a bow don't go start working at a bow shop you know that kind of deal don't don't do <laughs> it so uh i i would agree i noticed that a lot of people uh that get into hunting and have a lot of time uh they're firefighters or at least volunteer firemen or whatever it may be. Uh, but there's something along those lines where you get into that industry, that, that, um, that career choice, you get a lot more time off. So if that's something that you want to do, definitely recommend it. Reach out to Jeremy. I'll leave the link down below where you can find Jeremy. And uh, again, thank you, Jeremy, so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Good luck on the rest of your season, which I guess by the time this comes out, your season will be done. So hopefully you've killed a buck by the Mm -hmm. time this comes out. Good luck on that. And, uh, and thanks so much. And then everyone out there listening again, thank you so much for tuning in. I really appreciate it. And like I always say, get out, live your life and love it.